In this video, I'm going to talk about different regions of the nephrons that are being affected by the hormones as well as by the medications. So here you can see that we have a nephron starting with the glomeruli, then we have the proximal convoluted tubule, it goes become a loop of Henle, the thin ascending part of loop of Henle then becomes a thick ascending part, then we have the distal convoluted tubule, and then finally we have the collecting duct. So here you can see that aldosterone is acting on the cortical part of the collecting duct while antidiuretic hormone is acting on the medullary part of the collecting duct. So first I would like to start with the prostaglandin which acts on the afferent arterial. So here is where the blood will go in, go into the glomeruli, get filtered in and then get out by the afferent arterial. So prostaglandin causes dilation of the afferent arterial as a consequence of which there will be elevated glomerular filtration rate due to the elevated renal plasma flow. And then angiotensin acts on the efferent arterial causes constriction of the efferent arterial. So if the efferent arterial is constricted there would be lower renal plasma flow. But since the pressure will build up here now there would be more glomerular filtration rate. And so since the filtration factor is the glomerular filtration rate divided by renal plasma flow, then angiotensin II will cause an increase in the filtration fraction. And then we have the atrial natriuretic factor which acts both on the afferent as well as the efferent arterioles. So atrial natriuretic factor is being secreted when there is an elevated volume in the atrium. As a consequence of which this hormone is being secreted which enhances volume loss and so it will decrease the blood volume. So what it does is that it causes afferent arterial dilation as well as afferent arteriolar constriction and so it will cause an elevated glomerular filtration rate that causes volume loss. In addition it acts on the sodium channels in the distal convoluted tubules and prevent sodium uptake to again enhance the volume loss. Then we have the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D which enhances the calcium absorption. We have aldosterone which acts on the collecting duct and causes the Na plus to be absorbed in exchange for the potassium. And then finally we have the antidiuretic hormone which enhances the water absorption. So given that prostaglandin causes dilation of the afferent arterial while angiotensin causes constriction of the afferent arterial, I would like you to know how application of the NSAIDs like for instance ibuprofen which inhibits prostaglandin as well as application of the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor like lisinopril or angiotensin receptor blockers like losartan which inhibit the angiotensin. Two, will affect the afferent arterial, afferent renal plasma flow, glomerular filtration rate as well as filtration fracture. So since the NSAIDs are blocking the prostaglandins therefore there won't be any more dilation of the afferent arterial and in fact there is going to be a constriction. And so since there is a constriction of the afferent arterial therefore the amount of the renal plasma flow will decrease and so therefore the amount of the glomerular filtration rate will also decrease. Now given that filtration fraction is the glomerular filtration rate divided by renal plasma flow. Both of them are decreased equally so the filtration fraction remain normal. And then for the ACE inhibitors as well as ARBs, what happens is that they will block the angiotensin II which is responsible for the constriction of the efferent arterial. So now we will have the dilation of the efferent arterial with these medications. And so since there is a dilation, there would be elevated renal plasma flow. And so renal plasma flow increases. And so since there is less pressure buildup, therefore the glomerular filtration rate decreases. Now filtration fraction is GFR, which is decreased, divided by RPF, which is increased. So there would be a decreased filtration fraction by application of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, like for instance Losartan. Next, I'd like to discuss the function of different diuretic medication. So mannitol as well as acetazolamide are the medications that act on the proximal convoluted tubules. And I will hold the discussion for now and discuss that in a minute. And then the other medications include the furosemide and etacrinic acid, which are acting on the thick ascending loop of Hemle by blocking the function of the sodium potassium to chloride co-transporter. And so these medications, like for instance furosemide, 
are used for the treatment of edematous states as well as pulmonary edema and ascites and the reason for that is that these two diuretics will enhance more water loss compared to the salt loss so there is more water that is lost compared to the salts and so these medications are good for the treatment of the edematous states like pulmonary edema and ascites they can also be used for the treatment of hypertension as well as hypercalcemia since there would be also loss of calcium by the application of these medications now side effects of furosemide include sulfa allergy ototoxicity gout as well as interstitial nephritis that you should be aware of the next classes of medications are acting on the distal convoluted tubules and these include hydrochlorothiazides as well as chlorothalidone which will inhibit the NaCl co-transporter. But at the same time these medications increase the paracellular absorption of the calcium. So one side effect of these medications is hypercalcemia. So these medications given that they increase absorption of calcium are good for the treatment of hypertension in patients that have osteoporosis. And then in addition, since hydrochlorothiazides and chlorotolidone lose more salt compared to water, Therefore, these medications are good for the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So again, furosemide, they lose more water, versus hydrochlorothiazide, they lose more salt. And so hydrochlorothiazide is good for the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. The next classes of medications are acting on the cortical portion of the collecting duct. And these medications are called potassium sparing diuretics, like for instance, spironolactone and epleronone, which inhibit the aldosterone. And then we also have amyloride and triamterine, which block the sodium channels. And then as the name implies, the side effects of these medications, which are potassium sparing diuretics, is hyperkalemia. And then finally, we have the demeclocycline, which inhibits the V2 receptors in the collecting duct. And so it will be used for the treatment of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. And then one other medication that also block off V2 receptors of the antidiuretic hormone is the lithium, which will block the V2 and thus cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So now I have one question for you. What medication is good for the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus caused by lithium? And the answer is hydrochlorothiazide since it induces more salt loss. So with this disorder, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, already too much water is being lost. So we would like to enhance some salt loss to help balance the electrolytes. And so due to the decreased blood concentration of salts, therefore there would be an upregulated sodium reabsorption as well as water reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. And then one other medication that can also be used for the treatment of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is amyloride which is a potassium sparing diuretics and what amyloride does is that it prevents the buildup of the lithium in the collecting ducts and so it will help resolve the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And then the next two medications are acetazolamide and mannitol which are acting on the proximal convoluted tubules and so acetazolamide functions by blocking the carbonic anhydrase. Now the function of carbonic anhydrase is to help convert bicarbonate into CO2 and water. So the reason for that is that bicarbonate cannot get absorbed directly in the proximal convoluted tubule so it will first have to be converted into CO2 and water. These components can now get absorbed and then inside the cell carbonic anhydrase again helps to form the bicarbonate and now it can get absorbed and go into the blood. So by blocking the function of carbonic anhydrase, acetazolamide inhibits the absorption of the bicarbonate. So now bicarbonate will get excreted inside the urine. And so therefore acetazolamide can be used for urine alkalinization which is used for the elimination of the acidic drugs. It can also be used for the treatment of metabolic alkalosis. Now, since the bicarbonate can no longer get absorbed, therefore the body will become acidic while the urine will become alkaline. So therefore, given that the body is now becoming more acidic, it can be used for the treatment of metabolic alkalosis. And so likewise, it can be used for the treatment of respiratory alkalosis seen in patients with high altitude sickness. And then finally, acetazolamide is used for the treatment of glaucoma by the fact that it decreases the aqueous humor secretion in the eye. 
So therefore, the applications of acetazolamide is urine alkalinization, treatment of metabolic alkalosis, as well as treatment of glaucoma. And then the final medication that we have is mannitol, which increases the tubular fluid osmolarity, and therefore it will prevent water reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, mannitol can be used to increase urine flow in patients with rhabdo myelysis. So you know how rhabdomyolysis can cause kidney injury by causing acute tubular necrosis. So you can minimize the kidney injury by increasing urine flow via mannitol in these patients. It can also be used to decrease the intraocular pressure as well as the intracranial pressure. But then one important side effect of mannitol that you have to be aware of is pulmonary edema. So mannitol increases the extracellular fluid volume, and so it increases the risk of pulmonary edema. So just be aware. While it can be used to decrease the intraocular pressure as well as the intracranial pressure, it can increase the risk of pulmonary edema. Okay, now to summarize the findings on the effects of different diuretics in the urine salt, urine potassium, urine calcium, as well as body pH. So all of these medications that I've listed here increase the urine salt loss. And just note that loop diuretics causes more water loss than the sodium chloride loss. And then with the exception of the potassium sparing diuretics, which decreases the urine potassium loss, every other medication also increases the urine potassium loss. Now I discussed earlier that thiazide diuretics increases the paracellular calcium absorption, and so there would be decreased calcium secretion in patients that are taking thiazide diuretics, but then there would be increase with the loop diuretics as well as acetazolamide. And there is no effect on calcium excretion in patients taking potassium sparing diuretics. Now I would like to remind you that the side effects of thiazide diuretics is hypergluc. So these medications cause hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, hyperuricemia, and hypercalcemia because they decrease the excretion of the calcium inside the urine. And then regarding their effects on the body pH, acetazolamide inhibits the absorption of the bicarbonate. So it will make the body more acidic, and so it will decrease the pH of the body. Loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics enhance the excretion of the hydrogen ion, and so there would be alkalinization of the body or increased pH. And then finally, with potassium sparing diuretics, since the level of urine potassium is so low, therefore the potassium H plus exchanger will give out some potassium in exchange for absorbing some hydrogen. And so therefore due to the absorption of the hydrogen ion, therefore the body will become more acidic and the pH will decrease. And that concludes our discussion.